Hello and welcome to the Ask Historians digital conference session, Who Tells Your Story? Misrepresenting the Past in Works of Historical Fiction. My name is Dr. Stuart Ellis Gorman, and I will be chairing this panel, which explores how the historic past is represented and mostly misrepresented in historical fiction, and whether audiences accept these representations as factual or accurate. Before we begin this session, however, we would like to acknowledge that the Ask Historians Digital Conference is taking place on the ancestral, unceded, and treaty territories of many Indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. We offer our gratitude to these peoples and recognize that colonial nations continue to benefit from the brutality that enabled the original settler colonizers to seize these lands. The AHDC organizers acknowledge both the land upon which we are virtually hosting this conference and the deep-rooted and long-lasting harms caused by white imperialism and settler colonialism. We invite you to read our full land acknowledgement in the video description below. Our first speaker is Hilary Jane Locke. Hilary is a PhD candidate at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia, researching historical fictions and how it informs public perceptions of history. She'll be presenting her paper, I can be put off instantly if something is not accurate, examinations of historical fiction, audience, historical fiction audiences and historical knowledge. Thank you. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm presenting from, the Wongal people of the Euro Nation, and I pay respects to elders past and present. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Anyone who has attempted to interrogate the representations of history in popular culture content, in films, television, games, and books, for example, knows that the subject is fraught. As historical fiction scholar Jerome de Groot has stated, research into historical fiction has been bedeviled by an overriding concern about the historicalness of such work. This concern can lead commentators, particularly in public reviews and journalism, to dismiss any anachronisms as untrue and undermining the quality of the historical product. This also includes scholarly debates about the attempts of accuracy in these representations and what creators should be aiming for in their recreation of the past. De Groot has also stated that historical fiction is a slightly more inflected form than most other types of fiction. The reader of such works are slightly more self-aware of the artificiality and the strangeness of engaging with the imaginary work which strives to explain something other than one's contemporary knowledge and experience. As such, historical fiction content reflects upon creators' visions of an imagined past, however, historical fiction content also interacts and intersects with the audience's own perception of historical knowledge, whether to challenge it or directly inform it. In my paper today, I will be exploring just how audiences do respond to historical fiction content. I will be doing this by examining results from a survey conducted as part of my PhD research into how historical fictions inform percept people's perceptions of history. Firstly, I'd just like to give a brief overview of how the survey was designed. It considered a 40 questions aiming to garner as much information from historical fiction audiences as possible. The link to the survey was posted on Twitter, Facebook groups when allowed, Reddit groups, asking for additional circulation by colleagues, friends and family. Therefore, responders were typically a self-selecting group of people who had a general interest in historical fiction texts. Overall, the survey was designed to gauge audiences' feelings when, it when encountering the issues that historical fiction can raise, i.e. accuracy, inaccuracy, what attracts audiences to certain periods, and all the most popular texts. Many questions within the survey also allowed for written responses, which has aided in finding commonalities in how audiences feel about historical representation in these fictions, particularly when it comes to accuracy and anachronisms, as we shall see. Analysis of surveys results, I must stress, are in its fairly, very early stages. I received 1,200 responses in just over 12 months. This was a completely unexpected number, and as such, there is much more data than anticipated. Uh, a majority of survey responders were women, and responders were mostly in the 30 to 50 age bracket. Considering what is already known about the historical fiction market, with stories in the genre catering catering towards predominantly women, it is not surprising that 90% of respondents were women. As one responder said, I prefer historical fiction that is written or produced by women. I look for realistic conversations between people and not overly sexualized conversations of male fantasy. Readers were also given a space to indicate preferred time periods broadly and specifically. The top five 
periods were the 19th century, 18th century, the medieval period, Tudor period, and the 17th century. Readers also indicated they were specifically drawn to eras due to interest, such as this responder who stated, I enjoy reading novels for, about World War II from all differing perspectives more than other periods. What has been most fascinating is a lot of responders emphasize their desire for historical fiction to be accurate. What I will be exploring more in more depth for the thesis is this tie between the personalized sense of what is slash what isn't accurate and how this affects the experience of the text. Indeed, the word immersive was used 90 times by survey responders when reflecting upon what they look for in terms of quality in historical fiction works. The sense of immersion is created by how text can portray the historical period accurately or not, and therefore the audience can feel that immersion is broken if there is a certain amount of playing around with the historical setting. One survey responder said, no anachronisms, clothing, diet, culture, customs, even names must be true to the era. And another, I can be put off instantly if something is not accurate. Even the slight hint of the contemporary world can do this to the audience. One responder stating, one thing that immediately puts me off is characters who have unrealistically modern views on everything. Everything is put in asterisks. And another stating, I am not a his historicity pedant, but willful anachronisms in mood or technology or dress in the case of film tend to put me off. Or as another responder stated, specifically referring, referencing the Showtime series, The Tudors, I couldn't finish the Tudors TV show because Henry VIII's casting was so unbelievable. He was known to be in poor health, a redhead and overweight towards his middle age years. Even from these few quotes, it's extremely clear the emotionality and passion this topic inspires in people. Therefore, how readers feel about the qualities of, his, of historical fictions is important to consider. Ultimately, the distance that is created by whatever setting the novelist or filmmaker, for instance, chooses to use, creates an immediate expectation from the reader to be removed from the modern day into a world that has an automatic sense of difference from the clothes to technology and even the representation of speech. This difference in the setting is important to readers as one survey responder said, saying that novels should have no glaring anachronisms so I can relax into the work. To think a little bit more about this, this responder seems to state that if there are anachronisms in, within historical fiction, it creates a sense of unease and the content breaks the illusion of recreating the past. I would note here that 18% of respondents said that they felt betrayed on finding out that historical fiction is inaccurate, with 45% stating that they felt somewhat betrayed. A further 56% of respondents said that it was important to them that the historical fiction texts were accurate. Lastly, in order to measure how these texts are informing perceptions of history or used to generate historical knowledge, I allowed for questions about nonfiction and other educational avenues undertaken. 87% of respondents stated that they have read or thought about pursuing nonfiction materials relating to historical fiction subjects and settings. Furthermore, 33% said they were moderately likely to use information from historical fictions to develop their understanding of history. 27% said they were extremely likely. In providing written responses, there was a considerable split view about how they felt about the difference between the terms fiction and nonfiction in their reception of historical fictions. A good example of this can be seen in the following two quotes. On one hand, a responder stated that they agree that historical fiction did inform their view of history. Yes, that is why they need to be historically accurate or as near as they can be. Whereas another responder stated, I prefer books and dramas about historical periods which, about which I'm already pretty well informed. Also, I don't expect fiction to have the same informational purpose as factual work. Whilst we have two differing viewpoints here, it is clear to those who engage with historical fiction gain a certain perspective on, of history, whether to vindicate their existing knowledge of history or to improve it in general. With over 1200 responders to this survey, this presentation can only briefly touch on the themes that are starting to arise from the data. Overall, it is imp important to note that just how personally the perceptions of historical accuracy is taken by audiences when viewing historical fictions.
This is an element I will be exploring further in my PhD. However, as shown by the small sample of responses in this talk, there is a relationship between historical fiction content and the emotional response reception by audiences. This leads to further questions about whether, where historical knowledge comes from, what even is accuracy, and how it is that history fans are so drawn to historical fiction content. However, this paper has been a brief glimpse into my current research, which hopes to provide more details on that relationship between historical fiction content and historical fiction audiences. Thank you. Thank you, Hilary, for that very interesting paper. Our second spe speaker is Catherine H. Stutz. Catherine is a PhD student of classics at Johns Hopkins University, studying the history of Victorian polar expeditions, examining the influence of the ancient past upon depictions of Arctic and Antarctic voyages from the 19th century to the modern day. She'll be presenting her paper, Lady Franklin's Legacy, or The Fictional Afterlives of a Polar Explorer's Widow. Catherine. In 1845, Captain Sir John Franklin sailed from England into the Canadian Arctic to search for a Northwest Passage through to the Pacific Ocean. Neither Franklin nor any of his 128 crewmen returned home alive. Although Franklin's expedition has been the subject of extensive historical scholarship over the last 170 years, the bereaved families impacted by this disaster have remained mostly relegated to the margins of history. The main exception is the captain's wife, Jane, Lady Franklin, who left behind an extensive legacy through the numerous letters she wrote in her attempts to persuade other explorers to search for her absent husband. Despite her mythologized depiction as an enduringly faithful spouse, however, Lady Franklin's life without her husband was initially a difficult affair, plagued by issues both personal and financial that often threatened to shatter her ideal self-representation as a proper and demure Englishwoman. While dealing with constant public pressure to comment on her husband's whereabouts and legal conflicts with her stepdaughter over the terms of her husband's will, Lady Franklin retained a single-minded focus upon her husband's rescue. Thanks to her efforts, numerous search missions, dozens of ships crewed by thousands of men, scoured the Canadian Arctic and effectively filled in the remaining blank spaces on the British imperial map of the Arctic archipelago. By the time her husband was proven dead in 1859, however, Lady Franklin had largely moved on to new personal and geographic territories, traveling the globe with her niece, Sophia Craycroft. Several biographies and articles have examined the period of Lady Franklin's life following the disappearance of Sir John Franklin, but discrepancies between Lady Franklin's public and private faces have continued to puzzle modern readers of the historical record. One way by which this disconnect has been bridged, however, is through the medium of historical fiction. Diverse media have depicted the disappearance of the Franklin expedition, and Lady Franklin nearly always features in some capacity. She is unavoidably a point of view character, the lens through which the public views her husband's experiences in the Arctic. This paper examines three major categories of modern historical fiction media featuring Lady Franklin, poetry, novels, and television in order to show how recent representations of Lady Franklin's later years can illuminate the tensions that held together this Victorian woman's carefully woven self-image. Since the 19th century, poetic narratives have been a major source of popular knowledge, knowledge about the Franklin expedition. The ballad Lady Franklin's Lament, composed in the 1850s, seems to have first been sung aboard one of the many ships searching for Franklin and his doomed crew. The lyrics depict the dream of a sailor who sees a vision of Lady Franklin. As homeward bound one night on the deep, slung in my hammock, I fell fast asleep. I dreamt a dream which I thought was true concerning Franklin and his brave crew. I thought as we neared to the Humber shore, I heard a female that did deplore. She wept aloud and seemed to say, alas, my Franklin is long away. Her mind, it seemed in sad distress. She cried aloud, I can take no rest. 10,000 pounds I would freely give to say that on earth my husband lives. Incorporating real historical details, such as the 10,000 pound reward offered to the discoverer of Franklin's fate, this song does not question the valor of Franklin's mission, describing his, tr his crew as brave or in other variants, gallant. But as the scope of the disaster unfolded, blame came to be placed upon various actors for the deaths of these English sailors. Xenophobic commentators like Charles Dickens blamed the local groups of Inuit who inhabited the region, 
Newspapers blamed the tin goods supplier Stefan Goldner for providing the expedition with spoiled food. And many, scholars included, blamed Franklin for his imperial hubris. And through poetry, Lady Franklin came to bear some of her husband's responsibility herself. Modern poet David Solway's poetry collection, Franklin's Passage, published in 2003, serves as one of the earliest pieces of Franklin literature to engage with the mythologizing of Lady Franklin. In the poem, Dear DS, Solway satirizes a 20th century scholarly trend of deriding Sir John for his submissiveness to his wife and thus blaming Lady Franklin for the Franklin disaster. Franklin was the wrong man for the job, Solway's judgmental narrator argues, fatuous, overweight, slovenly bovine, aproned to his wife's ambitions. Oh, but that Lady Franklin was a piece of work, a block of calculating ice. Franklin himself was just piecework. These themes of Sir John Franklin as a victim of Lady Franklin's omnivorous ambition were picked up by Corinna McClanahan Schroeder in her poem Letters to the Dead, which takes the form of epistles written by Lady Franklin to the absent Sir John. Dear love, Schroeder's Lady Franklin writes, faithful Penelope they call me, but I sent you off. Your orders make a legend in our name. Schroeder was not the first, however, to see the literary potential of letters written by Lady Franklin to her absent husband. Two years prior to the publication of Schroeder's poem, historical scholar Erica Barish Elka stepped into the world of fiction writing with the epistolary novel, Lady Franklin of Russell Square. Elka's work accomplished two innovative tasks in the world of Lady Franklin fiction, both attempting to access Lady Franklin's own emotional experiences and also arguing more directly against the notions expressed by these unsympathetic narrators, i.e. that Lady Franklin's ambitions outweighed any love she might have had for her husband. Elka's Lady Franklin complains, too often they forget love. I am too rarely accused of loving you. Too often they forget fear. I am too rarely accused of being afraid in your behalf. In contrast, Dan Simmons' earlier 2007 novel, The Terror, perhaps the best known written work of Franklin fiction, lacks the nuance of Elka's epistolary novel and instead merely leans upon the familiar trope of Lady Franklin's unbending convictions. As deep and sincere as Sir John's faith in God was, Simmons writes, his faith in his wife was even deeper and sometimes more frightening. Lady Jane Franklin was an indomitable woman. Indomitable was the only word for her. Her will knew no bounds, and in almost every instance, Lady Jane Franklin would bend the errant and arbitrary ways of the world to the iron command of her will. The AMC miniseries The Terror, adapt adapting Dan Simmons' novel of the same name, manages to present a richer version of Lady Franklin than its direct source material by incorporating discourses from other fictive and scholarly texts. The show often uses Lady Franklin as a meta-narrative voice, allowing her to comment upon the process of historical distortion through personal legacy as a form of fiction. In the opening scene of the fourth episode, Jane Franklin, portrayed by Greta Scacchi, faces down the Admiralty in an attempt to convince them to send ships into the Arctic to search for her husband. Most of you gentlemen have written your memoirs, Lady Franklin argues. I've read them. The past tense is a very sturdy thing. It's earned, but it does take for granted that one has survived. Later, Lady Franklin's last appearance in the miniseries reveals this genre savvy statement about the past tense to be somewhat prophetic. During a sequence at the beginning of the ninth episode, Lady Franklin appears on stage to give a speech in an effort to recruit wealthy donors to the cause of her husband's rescue. The camera moves closer and closer to Lady Franklin's face as she speaks. The focal point is not her whole face, however, but only her mouth, so that by the end of the speech, her eyes are out of frame. At this point, a jump cut takes the viewer to a scene of gore and horror, one of Franklin's crewmen lying dead on the ground with most of his head torn off, leaving only the lower jaw behind. The cinematography draws a parallel between Lady Franklin and the dead man, reminding the viewer that this fictional Lady Franklin retains the erroneous belief that her husband is yet alive. She has no greater insight into the mystery of the Franklin expedition's disappearance than her real historical counterpart ever had. Ultimately, 
Fictions about the Franklin expedition that depict Lady Franklin frequently center around themes of blame and responsibility, asking who was at fault for the Franklin disaster by depicting Lady Franklin and the British Admiralty in conflict. By elevating Lady Franklin from a colorless mirror of the curious audience to a complex point of view character in her own right, certain fictions are able to propose viable historical answers to questions about Lady Franklin's experiences and motivations during the search for her missing husband. What this narrow historiographical framework conceals, however, is that Lady Franklin, just like the Admiralty itself, had a broader impact upon the world than merely attempting to resolve the impossible question of John Franklin's disappearance. Both Lady Franklin, the polar widow par excellence, and the Admiralty whom she attempted to bend to her will, acted as promoters of the same grand imperial project of British expansion. These fictional portrayals reflect Lady Frank Franklin's legacy as a perpetual widow trapped within her husband's legend, but in doing so, they often neglect her own experiences as an imperial British adventurer in her own right, for better or for worse. Thank you for that very interesting paper, Catherine. Our third speaker is Edmund Voitz. Edmund is a master's student in history at Ghent University, studying social dynamics in polar exploration. He will be presenting his paper, Sexual Skylarking, From Speculation to Historical Truth in Franklin Expedition Scholarship. Edmund. When the Franklin Expedition, already mentioned a few times, gets declared dead in uh, 1854, nine years after leaving England, it leaves an open space for speculation and theories. Even the 59 McClintock discovery of the Victory Point record doesn't really give a satisfying answer beyond, well, they starved while walking to the Hudson Bay Company Fort. Not all of these theories, however, have been historiography. Some of them are simply fictional with or without attempts at actually offering up proper answers. One of these is the novel The Terror by Dan Simmons, which got adapted for television in 2018 as the first season of AMC's The Terror. Both the book and the TV show are survival horror with supernatural elements, and so one can easily state neither one of these offer a proper theory of what really happened. Yet the show did gain a steady dedicated following over the last few years that strongly attached itself to the history behind it all. His following has largely been gained through word of mouth, with many people being attracted to the historical accuracy and the relationships that happened between the men, rather than the supernatural horror aspect of the show. The attraction is not abnormal. The showrunners and its writers have been very open about their use of primary sources and no literature, as well as consulting some of the researchers themselves to get as close to reality as they could, the demon polar bear aside. On social media and just through a quick Google tweets and other information about exactly what books and what material they used are easily found. This does, however, create, together with the way the Franklin Expedition research community in itself, not just the terror fandom, exists and works, create two kind of loops. The first one is one I'm calling a reception bias one, where the easiest way to get into the actual history is to simply follow what the writers recommend. These are the popular books and are easily available. It does, however, mean that when people read them, they will notice things or tend to notice things that have been in the show much more than they notice things that haven't been in the show. This can be as simple as the characterization of a character ending up on the real historical person, especially for lesser known people, as well as straight up turning speculation into historical fact. I will give two quick examples of this. Both are related to the popular character of James V. James, who in the show goes from arrogant and vain to likable and quite close friends with Francis Crozier, his initial nemesis. He's very susceptible to queer readings in the fandom. After all, he has a past full of secrets about who he is. He has a scene where he looks longingly at a dress and the ship of him and Crozier is quite frankly the popular one in the fandom. These queer readings have pulled themselves eventually into the readings of historical fit James, though I want to stress this is obviously not a judgment on queer fit James readings, fictional or real. One of the older theories on gay events in fit James' life has to do with the following quote from William Battersby's biography, which has been used by the showrunners. 
There is no doubt that young officers led a fairly energetic social life. Battersby writes, only a few days later, Fitz James recorded that he had been skylarking with Boyd in the gun room at 10 p.m. and almost choked to death. Who knows what the skylarking evolved? Exclamation mark at the end of that sentence as well. This event has been interpreted by the fandom uh, a few years ago as Fitz James giving Boyd oral sex and choking during it. The original Tumblr post that made this um, statement popular had the following arguments in it, which immediately show quite a lack of historical knowledge. And therefore also immediately they removed their own initial arguments. The main argument was that the gun room has no food so that Fitz James couldn't be choking on food. This, however, isn't correct. It's very easy to choke on food in a gun room as it is a mess room and not a storage room for guns. The author did cut correct on it and I did acknowledge it, but like the, the main argument still fell away. Meanwhile, they put skylocking down as being a vaguely defined term, which it isn't. It's a pretty known nautical term that, that means to play in the rigging. There was also apparently once a mention of skylocking as a euphemism in the late 18th century. But overall, skylocking has been very common for um, the Royal Navy to be used as simply to mean play wrestling or play fighting or just climbing up the rigging. They also say that Battersby meant innuendo when he said who knows what the skylocking involved. We cannot actually be sure of this. Battersby is very eager to talk about the same journal as involving mentions of sex with female prostitutes. He also said they cannot be asked about his opinion on the skylocking and what it involved as he died a few years back. But I will say that the author of the original post wasn't 100% convinced of whether or not it was actually oral sex, but it still did rounds as the Fit James suck dick post and became a staple in the fandom for queer Fit James readings. Whilst currently in 2021, the historical argument has lost some strength with the whole quote coming out, namely Friday 21st, skylocking in the gun room with at 10 hours with Boyd, got choked and nearly went to the hooks. Despite this quote, it still stays for some older people as a historical fact and stays a major point in arguing that historical Fitz James was queer. The second example, however, is far more direct, namely that Erebus surgeon Stephen Stanley, who was on the Cornwallis with Fitz James during the First Opium War, was the man who operated on Fitz James after the letter got shot. The show takes this as to have happened and drops it during a conversation in episode one. Historically, technically, we can make an argument for it. Fitz James was in charge of hiring the officers and Stanley wasn't too particularly liked by his assistant surgeon Goodsir, while Fitz James seemed to have found him at least a little creepy. With Battersby writes the following speculation. Possibly he was the man who had operated on Fitz James to remove the basketball from his belt. He doesn't put his speculation down as fact, however. Though it could be that he initially intended to, as you check the index from the book, it will, lead, it will list the page for the first mention of Fitzjames injury under St Stanley Stephen. However, on the page itself, Stanley isn't mentioned. It is also sadly not known whether Battersby tried to check any medical logs from the ships to get more information on this, as his sighting isn't particularly good. But the speculation has sadly become fact. With many people accepting to the show mentioning it that Stanley was the surgeon who did the operation. However, both of the examples form a second loop, which is more related to the community itself, especially in the way it deals with newer people, many of which are tariff fans, recommendation and citing, which is more loop citing and loop recommending. Namely, the community largely exists as a Facebook group where a lot of the popular researchers are active, even though a lot of them also have Twitter, most of the conversation takes place on Facebook. The academical historical presence also is rather low. This is not a dig at amateur historicals. It's simply a sad fact that most of the information is non-academical, especially when we're not talking about archeology span or biology or any way the Frank exhibition may have died. This means citing mistakes and also insufficient citing. And considering that primary sources are hard to get your hands on, this is a problem because those books and occasionally paid world articles are all that people have to check anything. 
Yet the community doesn't always point out these mistakes. When people like Michael Palin's error bus, there is rarely a declaimer that Palin makes obvious mistakes. And when Woodman recommends his blog, a blog in the intro of his book, he praises it without mentioning that Potter will occasionally write on speculation as fact and doesn't always cite his primary sources. For a book that strives to be academical, this is a mistake. Within those books as well, you will always get redirected back to the same old books. Michael Smith may pretend his biography of Crozier is the first one to exist, ignoring Mae Fluman, but he's fine with using her unexplained calculation for Crozier's heights. Every new book will cite older books, often copying their mistakes and recommending them to newer people who may not know such mistakes, and within this community is a simply too little drive to create awareness about them. This is obviously not a problem just existing within the terror fandom slash the Franklin Expedition community, but it is in the weird way those communities are intertwined in such a way that the issue is much better shown than for larger events like World War II history. And because there is no academic literature to fall back on, there is simply no proper base to compare popular history against. I don't blame the fandom for this because I think that the fandom has increased the amount of people who will who want historical accuracy um, in their in their research, and I think that because of that accuracy desire, that they are very much the people who will call out said mistakes in the future rather than the older researchers that still exist. Thank you for that very interesting paper, Edmund. I will now pause for half a second for everyone to clap vigorously at home. Thank you. And then we move on to our discussion, which is great because there's lots of interesting material to discuss here. And I will exercise my privilege as chair to ask questions of these researchers. Firstly, should we differentiate between inaccurate works of historical fiction and fiction that deliberately portrays an inaccurate past? As an example, the cinematic classic A Knight's Tale makes no claim to accuracy, but is also a far superior film to Braveheart, which does. Does the intentionality behind the inaccuracy and or the degree to which the inaccuracy is obvious matter? So um, there's an example from another piece of Franklin fiction that I didn't get to mention because there is such a breadth uh, that I think speaks really interestingly to some of the questions that of accuracy and authenticity and anachronism, um, especially that, that Hillary outlines for us so beautifully. Um, so this is a French Canadian Franklin fiction novel called On the Proper Use of Stars by Dominique Fortier. It's been translated into English um, and became quite popular, it did very, very well in Canada. In that, in, in an early chapter, Lady Franklin's niece, Sophia, remarks to a suitor, don't stay too long in the rain, you're beginning to look like Mr. Darcy when he takes it into his head to dive into the duck pond. Um, which Mr. Darcy turns out to be a reference to the Franklin's dogs, um, so it's not technically an anachronism per se, but the most obvious reference is to the 1995 BBC miniseries adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, um, so it certainly takes the reader out of the historical context of the 19th century. Um, and as a totally anecdotal example, I found it quite jarring um, to be reminded of that present moment because yes, the fiction of you know, Jane Austen would be something that would be encountered by these historical actors, but a 1995 adaptation wouldn't have been. So I think it can be uh, definitely jarring as Hillary pointed out. And I think there's something to be said for at least creating verisimilitude, if not necessarily total accuracy. I think that intention thing is definitely the point. I think the, like, as you say, like the intentionality of something like A Knight's Tale is to, you know, essentially tell a different story, a historical story, I guess. And, you know, you can read A Knight's Tale as a retelling or an adaptation of Chaucer, roughly. You can also read it as a sports film. You can also read it as like a interesting interrogation of uh, historical jousting, which we don't really see much on the screen. Um, which is also sport. So I think intentionality is like the crucial point of that. Um, but I'll, I think it also depends on the audience. Like you're saying, the sort of jarring nature of it. Um, I've taught A Night's Tale before and some people in the tutorials absolutely love it and they think it's the best thing that we teach in the course and other people are like, I cannot stand the, the modern music, the anachronisms, it puts me off. So yeah, like I was saying with my survey responders, there's definitely that sort of sense of, what they feel comfortable with in their historical product. And I think that's probably the line that I guess we're trying to figure out, like where where we sit personally, but also where 
audiences sit as well. Yeah, I, I definitely think there's like a difference, obviously, between how comfortable is the audience and how comfortable are the movie makers. But I think that line will shift if you like intentionally say, I'm not making historical fiction accurately as like a night still does because like honestly most of the people who get into the terror i think if the terror had obviously not gone for all the historical accuracy that they tried to go for more people would have accepted the demon polar bear and that often puts them off because the demon polar bear is the only thing that isn't historically accurate about the entire thing and it's like this weird thing where people are like I really liked it until the polar bear showed up and then it's like this isn't accurate anymore and I hate it and it's like yeah I get where it comes from despite the fact that you clearly weren't like this is supernatural horror like it's still this weird thing of the polar bear is too modern and as well as just, I think it also just comes with the realism effect because many people at the same time also complained that they weren't really happy with the fact that the people didn't look cold because they were shot in the scenes were shot in Hungary in like a really hot deserty place and everyone was like they really don't look cold they look like they're hot and I'm like okay but they do like have breath obviously coming out of their mouth it was such a weird thing for me but like I also accepted the polar bear so I don't think I can say much about like feeling weird about people not looking cold I have to confess that I went in knowing there was a demon polar bear and still kind of got put off by the demon polar bear. It was it wasn't really for me. So to kind of jump further into this, um, should works of historical fiction include a bibliography? Is that something that we think is kind of a best practice, or does it kind of run the risk of perpetuating a small handful of sources in the popular imagination? It is the practice, like in historical fiction novels. Um, I don't know where the trend came from. Um, I'm only looking at novels in my PhD from 2000 onwards. So I'd be interested to go back further and see where it started. But it is the practice. And like, it's something that I find quite interesting as a sort of um, a feedback, loop, having this feedback loop effect. And what we're sort of talking about, like people within like a sort of like relaying the same sources and sort of that sort of thing. But I I had one of the survey questions asked whether people actually read that because I thought that was very interesting, like if actually the people do actually engage in it or not. Turns out they do. They do like to read it. They like to know. But I think it's kind of, it could be potentially quite dangerous in a way because I think what happens is people go along and read these books and then they get to the end. And I mean, I would include things like the author's note or historical note alongside the bibliography as these sort of um, paratext materials that, or paratext materials that work within the book. Um, for so people kind of go, oh, well, I know now what's wrong and what's not wrong because the author's told me, or I can easily go and access these books. But I'm actually, I, I haven't quite delved into the data of that, but I think there's a sort of, you know, um, what's the word, dissonance between people who would actually look at that bibliography and then go and read a biography that they've they've then um, seen in this particular list. I think the people who watch the terror might be a bit different for like general historical fiction audiences. But yeah, there's a, there is a very different, like there is a dissonance between the two of them, I think. But it is the practice to have it in there. And if you don't have it in there, it's particularly strange. I feel like maybe it's also like with the length of, how many because like is it historical fiction will obviously have like a list but then for example i'm gonna start about hamilton hamilton was based on one biography largely like we know miranda used other sources as well as like primary sources as well as literature but he also clearly mentioned he bases on this one biography and i forgot to do to wrote the biography but like many people have just like read that biography of Hamilton along with the musical rather than just reading more about it. Catherine is telling me it's von Chernow who wrote the biography. But like even in an essay I read, like the was a teacher, a school teacher, and he was using Chernow's biography to teach his students, but he also instantly mentioned like, I'm technically making a mistake. I shouldn't be reading Chernow. I should be reading something else that's quite less politically of ideologically 
motivated than Cherno because apparently it has quite a leaning. <laughs> I will say you can buy copies of that biography at Hamilton shows. <laughs> of course you can. <laughs> I think um, I really appreciate the bringing up of Hamilton because I think um, the question of what medium are we talking about um, and how you incorporate a bibliography into your different historical fiction media differs really radically if you're talking about a novel versus other pieces of media. Um, if you're writing a TV show, we don't have a standard way for talking about here's the source that I used. Um, so, you know, our example for the, the terror, and I'm sure Edmund has seen these, I know for a fact, but, you know, the showrunners have posted like shelfies of their the entire list of books that they used. Um, but when you're something like a media, musical, you also don't have necessarily the opportunity to write out a full bibliography. So, I mean, in the case of Hamilton, it is absolutely just that Miranda used just the Chernow biography. But um, I think it is interesting how these different types of, of settings can modify the information communicated about bibliography. Um, one of the poems that I talked about, uh, Corinna McClanahan Schroeder's Letters to the Dead, is a short poem about Lady Franklin. It's really only a few pages. Um, and it's published in a, a literary journal. So there's really not a lot of room for bibliography. But even so, she has a footnote saying, you know, I mostly used this specific book, which happens to be Ken McGugan's Lady Franklin's Revenge. Um, and that's kind of the primary source that I used um, because it was important that audiences be able to go read it. But yeah, you don't get a full roster of here are people with different opinions about Lady Franklin than Kenneth McGugan. Um, so I definitely am very curious about where the origin of that system comes from, because hopefully, since we've been able to work bibliographic information into novels, maybe we can begin to work it into other pieces of media as a standard thing, and that might hopefully enable people to do more of that actual historical research if they actually are going out and reading stuff, um, which is promising, I think. Um, so, yeah. I would add that um, the, I quite, I don't quite know the word, but sort of the promotion of the historical uh, fiction, cons uh, historical consultant on fictional TV series has been an interesting turn, especially in the last sort of, I guess it's probably coincided with Twitter, having these sort of publicly known um, historical consultants. H Hannah Grieg comes to mind or Greg, I can't remember how you pronounce her last name, but she works on a lot of shows. She's also a professor at the University of York and she's very much there on Twitter promoting her own work, but also work of other people to kind of coincide with this sort of idea that there is someone historical working on there. And I mean, part of my research is sort of trying to like compile a bit of a database of recent historical fiction TV shows and movies and seeing if they actually have a like a historical fiction consultant or a historical consultant. And it, I get really disappointed when I find that there isn't one or if they've been based off a biography, this is something I've also noticed, if they've been based off biography, they don't employ a consultant. They just use the biography as a source, which is interesting because the biographies have their own set of issues. So yeah, <laughs> it's problematic and there's problems in the system, but yeah, I think the historical consultant is very interesting turn, especially with the sort of rise of social media and the promotion of those sort of factors as well. Yeah, just to bounce off that super quickly, but um, the, the television show Domino, which just started airing this year as a historical fiction piece about the fall of the Roman Empire. And I remember I actually follow the person who was their historical consultant on Twitter and she had to keep it under wraps until the show had aired. But then she got to do like an announcement being like, by the way, I was the historical consultant. Also, they didn't listen to me on lots of things. And that's why you've got 2000s era eyeshadow on characters from, you know, 63 BC, 44 BC. <laughs> yeah, definitely not being listened to is like one of the dominant things I've heard because I'm in Dublin and we film loads of stuff here, especially the Vikings. And I'm a medieval historian, so a lot of people on the Vikings, they're like, yeah, they asked me a question. I said, it's not like that. They said, director says it stays in. That was my day. I do think, uh, just bring back to bibliographies, one of my favorites I've ever read in historical fiction was from Gore Vidal, and it was either in Julian or Creation, I can't remember which one, but he begrudgingly includes one. He's very annoyed about it. He kind of feels like he shouldn't have to, but Robert Graves included one in iCloudius, and therefore people will expect him to have done it. 
So here's his bibliography. He doesn't really recommend it. <laughs> and it's like, okay, okay, buddy. Sorry to interrupt. I do really wonder if it is publisher led thing as well, mm. because like people just expect it to be within the historical fiction book at the end. I think that's a perfect example of that. You know, it has to be here. Otherwise people will lose their minds about it. You know, <laughs> I do also note like a lot, some of them, they put it at the front of the book. So it's like really call attention to it versus obviously, you know, usually when you're writing a history book it's at the end and you kind of assume that almost no one's going to look at it. Uh, to move on, historical fiction has the ability to tell stories of people left out of traditional historical narratives. In particular, the papers in this session have emphasized the role of women in historical fiction. When fiction is telling the story of an underrepresented group who may not be well documented in historical sources and literature, how do we assess the accuracy of that, wor that work? What are the benefits and potential pitfalls of constructing a fictional narrative outside the scope of mainstream history? One of the interesting things to me is that the specific case of Lady Franklin is one where there is all of this um, availability of information about very specific female historical figures. Um, so you can get all of this data about Lady Franklin because she left lots of letters um, and also massive amounts of journals, which are currently locked up in the Scott Polar Research Institute in the UK and aren't accessible because of the, the whole world being in shutdown mode. But there is all of this available information. Um, but a lot of that has to do with her, her class position, um, being the wife of this very elite naval officer um, and getting information about women who weren't that high up the class ladder and God forbid getting information about Inuit women from the period is quite difficult. Um, so it's one of those questions where you want, for me, the process of researching this involved balancing, how do I communicate information about Lady Franklin without also sort of elevating her voice too far above the rest. And I've been trying to do other projects that balance this out and like delve into other historical figures. Um, and even just going into the question of her niece, Sophia Craycroft, who often exists sort of slightly more to the margins in some ways, um, it is really interesting to me. To build on that point about sort of that, that some women have that sort of historical resource to uh, for researchers to engage with. I think one of the other things that we see is the sort of finding a story that we can fictionalize and make a fictional character out of a historical setting. And so the sort of default response to that would be, I guess it doesn't have to be accurate because this is a fictional person and we can focus on accurate details if we want to. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that that's great way to approach it but I think that that's something that a lot of creators would engage with I think um, quite a lot of the books in the bookshelf behind me are written by women they're for women audience as I said 90% of responders were women to my surveys um, I think women just are looking to see stories about themselves in the pages and um, it's it's definitely this sort of I, I, def, I definitely see a lack of conversation about accuracy when we're sort of considering women on screen and women, historical women on screen and um, and women within the pages of historical fiction novels. So I think there's sort of a, there's a sort of what we're sort of talking about before, I guess, is like a weighing of priorities there. Like, do we, do we want women depicted on screen and in books or do we, do we want to like work with the historical material that we have that could quite easily restrict us restrict us in the way that we tell stories um and that goes for quite a lot a large breadth and depth of different minority groups and different groups within society historically as well yeah i am now like actually having a question do people require the same amount of like accuracy when we're talking about minority f historical fiction than they do with like more known things like mainstream fiction because like minorities aren't really non-existent in history we just like the research is really difficult and at times you have to read between the lines a lot and it's hard to find out and most of it's still locked more in academical research than it is in popular history so I'm like do we need the same levels like because I assume at least or I hope to be honest that most historical fiction at this point actually asks minorities 
or consults academic researchers for said minorities like for their accuracy but i'm like not sure if we adhere the same level of accuracy that we want from it from my experience um to answer that question a lot of people that i'm seeing in particularly in australia are writing about their own family history in historical fiction um so whether that's indigenous authors writing about some of the family history that they know about um so they're sort of able to tap into their own family retelling of it um, they're also able to access some archival material, but not a whole, whole, a whole lot. Um, one of an award-winning novel that just came out was about the sort of early Chinese um, migration to Australia, which happened during the um, the gold rush, um, and that she sort of tapped into her own family history there as well. Um, but yeah, it is a difficult thing because I know predominantly books that are on the bestseller list, uh, movies that are in the best, like the not bestseller list, what are they on the top 10 list of viewing, whatever, um, are predominantly white still. And I think that that is changing slowly. And I find by tapping into their own family histories, these creators are sort of able to work within their own framework, but also understand how the archival material that is there works within that framework, I guess. I mean, I don't want to speak too much on behalf of them either. So like, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's an interesting sort of uh, interesting that's thing that's happening, particularly in Australia, is this sort of tapping into family history to explore particularly Indigenous and settler violence and colonialism um, and also this sort of problem that Australia tends to have with sort of multiculturalism and slight xenophobia um, as well. So yeah, that hopefully that kind of taps into what you were trying to ask. <laughs> so that kind of nicely sets up another thing I wanted to ask about, which is, I mean, how do we factor in oral history into this discussion? Um, it's a source that's often overlooked, but it's also a very difficult source to work with, particularly if you don't have formal training in oral history practices, uh, which all of us might be working with it for the first time. So does an adaptation of oral history, which again, we kind of talk about, it might be someone writing family history, but it might be someone writing outside of that culture. Um, does it run the risk of replacing or eclipsing that oral history with a kind of fictionalized account? Yeah, to, to build off both this question and also kind of the, the previous discussion, I'm really intrigued by what Hillary was talking about in terms of that, the question of writing in some way your own family's experiences, there's a, a definite trend in the way that knowledge is built about the Franklin expedition that leans upon descendants and relatives of members of the crew. And it's very specifically descendants and relatives of members of the crew. It's a different question when you look at the way that like Inuit oral histories are recounted and people whose family witnessed that. Um, those discussions happen very differently. But if you look at the spaces of the historical knowledge building in these kind of informal groups, it's very often through people who, who claim descendant or, or relative capacity. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm guilty of this too. I'm fairly certain I have a great uncle who was like a stoker aboard one of the two boats. Um, but does that mean I have any family history about it? No, absolutely not, which is a little different compared to people who have like very clear demonstrable family ties as opposed to my hmm, same name, same person, same spot, think it's the same person. Um, but there's this attempt to sort of claim connection to these individuals. And I think often even that much erases sort of archival work um, in some ways and very much can threaten to erase the sort of the work done by Inuit oral historians. Um, and there's a documentary from 2008 called Passage um, that talks about those interactions and puts a descendant of Charles Dickens, who was, a, of course, a, a major figure in sort of the Franklin rescue mission efforts, in a room with this major um, Inuit leader and sort of has them talk. And I think the ability of documentary film to capture that has a ton of potential. Unfortunately, I think the framework of the documentary also put in that room this really virulently racist author whose work I don't think we ought to be considering. And I wish the documentary had simply removed him from the room because the 
conversation between the Dickens descendant and the Inuit leader was actually great. Um, so I'm hopeful that maybe, again, new media um, opportunities to document things via film and via Twitter and online can maybe help kind of prevent that issue of written fiction possibly eclipsing oral, oral texts and oral history. I think to build on that a little bit, from what I've noticed, particularly within the Australian historical fiction community, is that a story is a story, no matter where it's come from. And it also ties into that kind of consideration of what, and this is also true for historical film and television as well, is what, to what extent do creators put effort into be accurate, I guess, and oral histories, I mean, I haven't really done much work with oral histories and they're quite intimidating, I think, for quite a lot of people. But if there is a story and there's a thread that can be followed from a, you know, a general hearsay story sometimes, they will follow it and sometimes they will then use it as a sort of, um, and I am generalising here, obviously, I'm not talking about any specific author or anything, but they will follow that thread and sometimes they can create a series or a whole whole story out of this particular thread. Um, and again, I think it's quite interesting to sort of think about it, but um, a lot of things that are happening in Australia is that sort of family history. Like you say that it could be, could be a, um, you know, a relative on that particular boat or whatever. Like a lot of that is, you know, coming through in historical fiction in Australia in particular um, that, you know, people, one of the most famous books that probably came out uh, in internationally is The Secret River by Kate Grenfell. And that was uh, a family history retelling. Um, but yeah, I think a story is a story to a historical fiction author or a creator. And so I think no matter where it comes from or what particular kind of histories they are accessing, I think they try and use it to make a story. I had like a, a vaguely different thought on oral histories. And I think it's because me and Catherine had a conversation with it a while back, which is like, um, it's quite difficult to be like, can you make fiction out of oral histories if you're not the minority of to which the oral history belongs? Because oral histories have like a lot of differences. A lot of the times I think in a class once we saw was Jan van Sina, whose theory in oral history is like quite well used and well known, but he like researched African tribes and they had these oral histories going back centuries. And it's like, can you make fiction out of such histories? And can you do it without, without really diminishing the oral history behind it? And will the fiction maybe like become more of the historical fact because it's documented more than the oral history will be? And also like writing down oral histories has always given problems because there's so many variants for a lot of them. Yeah, I think that is really interesting. And it is interesting, the kind of the putting the dick as the center. I always think it's a little weird when you just like pick descendants. Like there was a Dracula sequel that was written by Bram Stoker's descendant. And it's like, is he a good writer though? Like, <laughs> but uh, putting them in a room with an Inuit oral history and it does kind of immediately equate like a, an internal family history to an oral history. And they're often not, actually that close and the kind of practices behind them can be very different and I wonder if you run the risk of kind of cheapening it in a way if you're kind of directly comparing um, that kind of family research versus someone whose job might be to be an oral historian and, and yeah it's it's one of the ways I think we don't really it's very hard for us to engage with it and I think we don't necessarily take it as seriously as we should one thing I know we're kind of coming near the end so I think because this is a historical fiction panel we should consider recommending historical fiction to people. Oh, um, my recommendation is obviously uh, A Knight's Tale, but if you've already seen A Knight's Tale then, and you want something really weird and really medieval and very anachronistic, you should watch The Little Hours, which is an adaptation of a work from, um, from the Decameron by Boccaccio. So it's very Chaucer-esque and it's very funny and very weird. So definitely check it out. I am too far into the historical fiction world to sort of see joy in historical fiction works at the moment. Um, I think what I would recommend TV wise is probably Harlots, which is a series on Hulu. I really enjoyed that. It was quite a sort of tongue in cheek 
attempt at telling this history of uh, brothel workers in the 18th century uh, in London. Um, there's been quite some interesting, some quite interesting books that have come out recently, but off the top of my head, I'm not. <laughs> I'll take a picture of my bookshelf for everyone so they can see it <laughs> and post a picture of it. But yeah, I would definitely recommend Harlots and um, yeah. I'm gonna make Edmund go first. And if he doesn't say the thing I wanna say, then I'll say it, but he might steal mine. No, I'm actually not sure. <laughs> I was going to say the third, but like, quite frankly, I'm going to recommend Master and Commander because it's really historically accurate, the movie. The books are as well, but the books are apparently really tedious and I haven't read them. <laughs> so I'm just going to say the movie because it's really good. And like, even if you think it starts really slow, just stick with it. It's fantastic. And the birds look really weird. I love Master and Commander and I'm seconding that. That was not what I was thinking of, but yeah, Master and Commander, wonderful film. Um, I'm going to recommend the television show Turn Washington Spies, um, <laughs> which is uh, not necessarily the most chronologically accurate depiction of the American Revolution, uh, but I think it does a really great job getting at the mechanisms of Washington, George Washington's spy network during the Revolutionary War um, and does some really interesting stuff with the question of the role of women and the role of black people in early America and the question of enslavement. Um, so I think it's really cool. I think it's a very good show. It's on Netflix in America because it's about the American Revolutionary War and we have to be all American media on American Netflix. <laughs> So I'd like to thank our three speakers for their very interesting papers and their very interesting discussion. Uh, thank you for giving us your time, both speakers and you for watching this. And I will turn to the speakers to let them have their closing remarks. Yeah, thank you so much to my um, fellow panelists and Stuart for um, conducting a really great conversation there. I think we could have gone on for a long time discussing all the intricacies of historical fiction. Uh, I'd just like to thank the uh, digital conference for putting on a really interesting and different conference to be a part of, which has been fascinating. I'd also like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Stephanie Russo. Um, she's just written a book about Anne Boleyn. So go look at that as well, because it's really interesting um, about how she's been represented in historical fiction. Um, but in general, yeah, I've had a really good um, different time with this conference. So it's been excellent. And thank you everyone so much for uh, offering such great conversation and discussion. Um, I want to express my enormous gratitude to the friends, colleagues, and mentors who've supported me in my travels through the life of Lady Franklin and her contemporaries, including, but in no way limited to Dr. Alexa Price, Henry Treadwell, and my incredibly patient professor of classics, Dr. Karen Navalli. And all my thanks to my fellow panelists for their brilliant papers and discussion, and also thanks to Edmund for carrying the Franklin Expedition banner with me these many months, these many months together. I'm so appreciative of the opportunity to present in this panel. Thanks so much to Ask Us historians for putting this on. Uh, yeah, I want to thank Ask Historians for actually letting me do my first conference ever. So I'm like, was kind of stressed, but it's been really cool. And I want to thank my panelists for like, obviously the great discussion, the great papers. And um, I just want to do a shout out to people who maybe want more conference surrounding the terror and the Franklin expedition. Um, terror camp is being hosted by some people within the terror fandom, and it's going to be really cool. I think they should just be on Twitter, like at terror camp or something. So as they said, we have to thank Ask Historians for doing the conference. The team behind it, the organizing team, did a ton of work to make this all seamless and beautiful now that you see it. Thank our producers and everyone who was involved in the conference. Thank you for all the work you've done. And thanks everyone for the discussion we've had and the recommendations. We all have some mandatory viewing uh, between now and presumably next year's conference where there will be a test. Uh, so thank you everybody and have a good day. <laughs>